author Mark Levy with us and we are very excited to hear from Mark about his books and about writing and creativity, especially in times like these. Uh, Mark was the guest of honor at the Foundation's Translation Prize Awards Ceremony in 2018, um, where he spoke to us about his books, which have been translated into numerous languages. Um, so thank you, Mark, for being with us. Uh, I will first introduce our moderator, Karen, who will uh, talk with Mark and uh, take questions from our participants. So if you have joined our prior webinars, you will probably be familiar with Karen already. Uh, Karen is a novelist and the author of five novels, The Diplomat's Daughter, The Gilded Years, The List, The Price of Inheritance, and most recently, her book, A Hundred Sons, was just published in April. Uh, Karen started her career as a reporter and her work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the Miami Herald, just to name a few of many publications. And of course, Karen is a member of the Foundation's Young Leaders Program, which is the program that uh, I manage that brings together leaders from France and the United States to advance dialogue between both of our countries. So I will let Karen uh, take it away to start the conversation with Mark. And thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you all for joining us. I'm really honored to be here today with uh, Mark Levy, a man who needs no introduction, but certainly deserves one. So I will give uh, a brief intro and then we will get chatting. It also happens to be World Book Day. Who knew? Uh, so this really, uh, ça tombe bien. It's perfect timing. So Mark Levy. At 37, Marc Levy wrote a story for the man that his son would grow up to be. In early 1999, his sister, a screenwriter, now a film director, encouraged him to send the manuscript to Edition Robert Laffont, who immediately decided to publish, if only it were true, et si c'était vrai. Before it was published, Steven Spielberg and DreamWorks acquired film rights to the novel. The movie, Just Like Heaven, produced by Steven Spielberg, starring Reese Witherspoon and Mark Ruffalo, was a number one box office hit in America in 2005. After If Only It Were True, Marc Levy began writing full-time. All of his novels have hit the top of the bestseller list in France. They are also very successful internationally and are consistently on the bestseller list in several countries, including Germany, Italy, Spain, Russia, and Taiwan, and of course the US. Marc is actually in New York uh, right now. Marc, we were talking earlier and you said you had left the city. How are things going? Good, really good. Really good, thank you. Good, good morning or afternoon to all of you and uh, I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, and ready to take your question. And all right. Well, to... one thing we wanted to talk about today was fostering creativity. Um, you and I chatted briefly yesterday about how difficult it is sometimes to foster creativity in times of normalcy. And here we are trying to foster creativity in a very uh, specific period. So I, I was doing a little homework before this, and I watched an interview with you on France Info where you were talking about Ghost in Love, which is your 20th book. Mm -hmm. And I loved, I loved listening to you talk about how you got the idea. You said that you entered your office and you saw a photograph of your father, Raymond, and you thought, what would it be like if that photograph just started to speak to me? What would it be like if you just said, bonjour Marc? And that was sort of the spark that was that book. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I love, I think for a lot of writers, it's a little tiny thing that becomes a big idea. No, yeah, in, in my study, there is a very, uh, there is a big picture of my father, uh, which was taken probably like maybe 10 or 15, uh, more than that now, anyway. And, but it's, it's quite a big picture and it, it stands on a place where when I enter my office or when I leave my office, uh, it's the first thing and last thing that I can see. And I was used, you know, uh, sometimes when I left my office very late at night, uh, you know, just by leaving my office to say good night, Dad. Or, uh, you know, when I enter a morning and I'm not in a rush and I'm really, you know, facing this picture just to say, you know, good morning, Dad, even if my dad passed away uh, five years ago. And, uh, and it's true that one night while I was leaving my office and I, I, I said, you know, good night, Dad. And I was just walking down the stairs. And there was this quite, you know, a big silence. And I was 
thinking of him a lot. And I was, and suddenly the imagination came and I, I wonder, you know, and what if suddenly in your back, you know, you hear, good night, son. <laughs> uh, that would be, you know, the beginning of a, of a, of, of a weird, but, you know, a story that could become charming. And, uh, and so that's how I believe that that was a sparkle of the story. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Did you like sit down right away and start writing or did you kind of let it marinate? No, no, I, w I, went, I went to sleep and you know, while I was trying to find sleep, it's one of the thing, uh, it's, I mean, when you, when you write, uh, especially when you write at night, it's very difficult, you know, just to go to bed and, and just say to your brain, stop thinking and let's <laughs> sleep now. And so uh, you have always, you know, this period of time where you're in the black and uh, in the dark and you're still thinking. So no, I, I was thinking about it. And the next morning, of, and of course, I mean, some, some sparkles, some ID faded uh, with your memory. You just, you know, forgot them. Uh, mm -hmm. But this was so much related to a picture that I was seeing every morning and every night. That of course, the next morning, you know, while... I get into my office, I saw my, the, my, my father picture and I, I all literally started the game, you know, with the picture, like, you know, sitting in front and say, okay, what do you have to say today? <laughs> <laughs> and we start, and the book started almost like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. That, um, you said something else along those lines that I really love in the same interview. They asked you how stories come to you. They asked you if you had a lack of stories and you said, absolutely not. And you said, elles viennent principalement par le bonheur. They come mainly by happiness stories to you. And I thought that was so beautiful. I think, you know, for, for me, sometimes writing is just like torturous. And so to think that these ideas come to you from happiness, um, and you've had so many good ideas, I just, I thought that was really beautiful. Oh, no, no, do not misinterpret me. <laughs> You suffer miserably too, good. Yes, transforming these ideas into story is absolutely miserable and torturous and very painful sometimes. But uh, it's true that uh, w when I say it from happiness, I would say they come from, um, I think they come from emotion. Mm -hmm. I, for example, I remember the, um, there is some books where uh, I completely forgot, you know, how the ID came up. Uh, some books, I remember it very well because the, uh, something need the ID. And I remember when I wrote, for example, uh, a book, uh, which is called The Reverse Horizon. Um, in the, the, I, was in, I was in the process of writing another book. And then one Saturday morning, I opened the New York Times. And I was facing this uh, picture of uh, 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 a woman, uh, first name uh, was Kim and her boyfriend, Josh, and they were laying on a bed. And, and the story was uh, uh, telling the story about uh, these, these two uh, young people and, and they're both uh, students in, um, in um, uh, I'm trying to find the word in English, uh, um, not neurosurgeon in neuro uh, neurotechnology, I might say. Um, I'm not finding the exact word in English. Uh, and uh, and she was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and uh, which was not operable, and that would take her life, you know, uh, uh, in 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 a maximum of two years. And I was fascinated because the story was telling that she was uh, she was accepting the idea of her death. What she was not accepting, accepting was the idea that, you know, she wouldn't love, she wouldn't be able to leave uh, the love story she had with this man. Okay. And so in, uh, in, in idea of cheating with death, you know, uh, she wanted to be cryogenized. And uh, in the hope, you know, that one day uh, uh, her, uh, her body would be revived and, uh, and at the time where we would know how to cure that. And, and what triggered me uh, in, in the story was that while she wanted to do that, her father opposed that because her father was very religious and he said, you know, uh, I want to bury my daughter, which I found, you know, uh, very hard uh, to understand, you know, and, and, uh, and so she started to do a crowdfunding on the internet to get the money to be cryogenized. Wow. And, and she, she was in fact. 
and she went to be cryogenized. And so I was very moved by this story because even if the story looks dramatic, it was full of hope and, and full of love uh, from unknown. And even in the reaction of the father, there was a, a fascinating expression of love uh, um, and of pain and of how to deal with pain, which, which I think makes uh, the, the human so fascinating. Um, and so the, the idea came to my mind like in five seconds and I stopped literally the, uh, the book I was writing and I rushed to write uh, this book, The Reverse Horizon, which tells the story of uh, Kim, except that from, in my book, instead of being cryogenized, uh, she transferred her soul or her consciousness into a computer. And 50 years later, the computer we transfer consciousness in another body. Right. And then it's all the quest of finding whether or not uh, Josh has survived and if they will, you know, meet again. And uh, the most moving part of the story was that, so I went out of the, uh, the book was published. And a few months after the book was published, I received an email from the real Josh. No way. Yes way. And... Uh, and that was very moving because he said, you know, he said, he said, you know, uh, I heard about the book and I heard about the story and I read the book and um, somehow uh, through the page of the book, she is alive again. No. And and that was, you know, I think maybe one of the purposes of writing, and and that relates also the reason why I was bringing this story is because it has also some relationship with. The story you talked about, you know, in Ghost in Love, which mm -hmm. is, you know, making people alive until, uh, I mean, people are alive uh, until you think about them. Absolutely. I, that's, um, I think, such a big part of being a writer when you said sometimes you just can't cut things off. I always say, you know, writing is very solitary, but you have all your imaginary friends to hang out with all the time. So it's not that lonely. Yeah, which is why you really have to choose your friends before you start to write a book because if <laughs> they are not good friends, you're already in pain. That's, that's, that's very true. Um, one thing... I have, I have huge admiration for my, my fellow colleagues who write, you know, a crime series and we have to deal for many months with murderer, serial killer, uh, monstrous people. I'm, I always wonder, how do, you, how do you do to spend, you know, so much time with them and how that, you know, doesn't affect you? I feel much more, uh, um, uh, uh, beaucoup moins de mérite. Uh, I have less uh, courage, yeah. maybe, because uh, I tend to have characters that, you know, I enjoy spending a lot of time with. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy spending a lot of time with your characters, too. It's, it's very pleasant. I think maybe if you're writing crime novels, the fact that you maybe get to kill off the bad people at the end, you have to suffer through and then yeah um but yeah so going back to this this very unique time i know um you know one thing that's always really fun for me and uh, probably other authors is you spend all this time alone but then when your book comes out you're kind of released back in the world you get to have events you get to see people um how how are you dealing with the fact that you know i know you have a book coming out in the u.s may 12th how are you planning to to celebrate that occasion without getting back into the world. The, the book is A Woman Like Her, by the yeah. way, Pico Mel. Well, the, the, I mean, due to the virus situation, there will be no book tour, there will be no book signing, everything is going to be virtual. And uh, I mean, it's somehow it's going to be uh, even more lonely uh, than usual. Uh, the, the process of a book release is a very uh, intricate and, and somehow a complex process as you say you worked alone in your environment for months and months and, and you were you know on your island and uh, it's literally like you know in this gorgeous french movie uh, the sauvage <laughs> your publisher comes and pick you in your cave or on your island and drop you in front of people and you have to talk and there's definitely a time of uh, adaptation i think the worst part is uh um the interviews uh 
I mean, I mean, it took you like, you know, about a year to write a story in 400 pages and suddenly a journalist asked you to uh, uh, resume the story in three minutes <laughs> uh, and in a few words. And you say, but, you know, if I had been able to tell my story in three minutes and in a few words, I would have, you know, I would have done other things than spending like a year telling and my you story. you tweeted it, just a tweet, tweet story. I know. And that's... It's, I say it's a very difficult process because you you have not even digest yourself your story, and uh, I think your most of the most of the others are the worst ambassador of their own story. I totally agree with that. It's so hard, <laughs> you know. And I, I'm I'm there is much harder thing uh, in life when I'm using the word hard. You know, being working in a hospital nowadays is a, a zillion billion times harder. So everything has to be put in perspective but i'm just saying that there is something as a natural for a writer to go out and speak about his story right away and you know if you ask to a chef in the kitchen to get out of the kitchen enter in the dining room and start to <laughs> sing and dance to present you know uh, uh, his, his meal and he, and that would look ridiculous and really weird well i have this same feeling every time you know I, i've just finished a book and you have to go out and say uh, and explain everything. I think it's really weird. The other part, which is much nicer and funnier, is um, not the book signing, which are always weird. You know, this idea of a line of people. And me personally, I feel very embarrassed. I'm sitting on a chair. I do all my book signings standing up after many years, because for many years I was doing my book signing, you know, seated behind a desk and I was watching at the line and I could see, you know, this 75 years old man or uh, 80 years old woman and she was standing on the line for like half an hour and I was sitting at my desk and I feel like, you know, extremely embarrassed and, and, and so now I do everything stand up. So at least, you know, it's face to face and it's more uh, yeah. courteous. But still, I would say that, you know, when there is no interaction, I don't get it. The, the only real fun part for me is when you do a, a, a book meeting where you, you are, you know, in a bookshop and, and people sit and you can talk and they ask you questions about the book and because you're not in front of a tv uh, audience you know you can you, you are allowed to say i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> i don't know Fair enough. when they ask you why is she doing this on page yeah. three you say i don't know i think sometimes people will tell me they're like oh your character did this obviously because of this reason this reason and i'm just like absolutely yes that is the right interpretation i have I mean, sometimes I, I have no idea what. No, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that the uh, the real enjoyable part of the uh, of releasing a book, um, it's to share moment with readers, but it's not being the center of the attention. Yeah, yeah, the conversation, right? Yeah. More than, absolutely, I agree with that. Well, let's uh, let's turn this positive so Emmeline doesn't say that we're we're too depressed. <laughs> let's talk about fostering creativity um, during a difficult time. I know you have a book coming out. Are you working on a book right now? Yes. Are you writing a book? How are you? How are you doing? Are you able to to find moments of creativity? Are you surprising yourself? No, I. I'm... I have had a lot of conversation with uh, uh, friends who are uh, either writer, uh, screenwriter, uh, stage writer, I mean playwriter, even songwriter, and um, we all came to the conclusion that um, it was really difficult to create in confinement. Yeah. I mean, we would have said the contrary, you know, being stuck in our home, you know, with really no option to do anything <laughs> else uh, would, you know, boost out the creativity. In fact, no. And I think it makes a lot of sense. Let's not make a drama about it. But creativity comes from interaction. Yeah. Uh, creativity doesn't come from, you know, doing a lot of research. I mean, research help, uh, help uh, uh, feeding your creativity and, and making it, you know, uh, concrete and 
and, and, and coherent and uh, intelligent, but creativity comes from all the accident of life that you witness uh, uh, outside in the street by, uh, by conversation, by, uh, when you were talking about my first book, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the idea came up from a conversation uh, over a dinner with my best friend, uh, I mean, she was, uh, uh, that was like 20 years ago, and she was in her 30s, and I was in my 30s, and she was my best friend for ev ever. And one day we had a dinner, and she said to me, you know what, I think I'm invisible. And so I looked at her, and I said, of course you're not. I mean, I'm at dinner <laughs> in front of you, and I can see. And she said, no, 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 listen to me. I'm single for the, I've been single for the last three years. You know, I wake up every morning, and I, and I, and I get into the, uh, uh, um, and I get in, into the subway and nobody sees me. And then, you know, I, I work on a TV stage and, and, and nobody sees me. And then I come back home in the subway, nobody sees me. And because I'm a single, the weekend I see no one, so I'm invisible. And what, after the conversation, I, I, I saw she absolutely defined the feeling of loneliness, being invisible. And that's how came the idea of this man, you know, who, find a woman in the closet of his bathroom and realize that he's the only one on hers that can see her. Uh, so what I'm saying is that creativity comes from interaction. Yeah. And, uh, and it comes from what you do in your life and it comes from the zillion of emotion that you have because of interaction. And so I think that confinement doesn't really help. So give up trying to write a book right now, people. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, we were talking yesterday and we, you said free time doesn't mean free spirit. And I think that's, uh, that's certainly something I feel and other creatives I've talked to feel. You just feel like your spirit isn't flying like it, it usually is. Um, but that said, you know, I, do you think a lot of literature will come out of this period? I feel like people might be inspired to write about it after the fact more than in the moment. I think, I think more about, uh, I don't think a lot of literature will come out of the virus experience. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the scenario of the virus was already uh, very well treated. If you look, if you watch uh, on Netflix, uh, uh, the, the Soderbergh movie, which is like three or four years uh, ago, yeah. called Contagion, I mean, the script, uh, almost fits to the situation we are experiencing right now. So I don't think the, the, the situation by itself uh, will create like, you know, uh, a lot of popular story. But what every people has experienced, humanly speaking, from the confinement, whether it's in, you know, uh, in relationship, in a love story, I'm thinking every day about how many people in love uh, are being separated by that, you know, and cannot be together and just, you know, uh, are back in the frustration uh, of uh, so many love stories that inspired the literature of the 19th century because uh, love was, was much more forbidden than it is today. Well, yeah. suddenly, somehow it is again. And so how this evolve, uh, uh, or at the contrary, you know, all the... Uh, um, more profound relationship inside your own home that emerge from the fact that you know you're spending more time than ever uh, with your close ones. So I think that this interaction will create a lot of story. I, I was reading in the New York Times the story of this terrible, terrible uh, building in the Upper East Side where a doctor from uh, a doctor specialized in uh, in respiratory disease, you know. Yeah. Traveled from Washington to help, went to New York and started to work in the ER, uh, uh, living, you know, uh, his life in Washington just to come to help. And his brother had an apartment um, in uh, Upper West, uh, Upper East Side uh, uh, building, and he said, "Take my apartment." And so the doctor spent, you know, I mean, sleep at night in this apartment, spent all his day helping and saving life in hospital. And one day he comes back home and, the, and the, the, the concierge of the building say, you have been evicted, you can't come back anymore. Yeah. The, 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 the board uh, learned that you were a surgeon working uh, in the hospital and they don't want you in the building. 
it's funny because the 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 article ended that, that you know the 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 brother asked that the building address would not be named because he didn't want retaliation from the board about telling the story about you know those miserable people this is typically i believe you know a story that can become a novel or a yeah. theater play yeah absolutely i've heard similar stories i i know it's happening to to nurses too um exactly you know, now now on the other day I've, I've heard about hundreds of amazing humanly positive story about you know uh, how people have mobilized themselves and have transcended their humanity and, and and done amazing things so i think that this is what is going to come out as creativity uh, stories uh, human behavior much more than just the context of the virus yeah yeah absolutely well I'm ready for that book about the eviction, Mark. I wait with bated breath for you to write it. Um, all right, well, I'm certainly not the only person here who has questions. We have a lot of viewer questions coming in. Um, you can, uh, my head is in French now. You can type your question right on the screen and I will see it and I will relay it to Mark. So I can start with questions now, Mark, if that's okay with you. Sure, of course. All right, Chloe, hey, Chloe has a question. She says, outside of your own work, of course, which French writers would you recommend, particularly up and coming writers? This is a complex question because you have, uh, let me put this like, you know, if you ask me out of the French cuisine, uh, <laughs> what meal would you recommend? I mean, my first question would be, what do you like? I mean, do you like sweet? Do you like bitter? Do you like uh, salty food? Do you like... Uh... So, literary is really based in terms of uh, uh, range of emotion and way of writing and process of writing. And it's... I'm always very concerned about giving recommendation. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example. I, I, I devoted most of my life to the United States and I've been fascinated by the history of this country. And recently I, I, I read the, the book of Colum Schneck, uh, Schneck uh, who is a wonderful book and I, I'm, I don't want to um, misspell the title, so I'm going to give you the exact title of the book. Uh, I think, yeah, Nuit d'été à Brooklyn. Uh, it's an amazing book, uh, which uh, happens in New York in the 90s, uh, which is a story of a French, a young French journalist who travels to New York with a lot of ideal and, and she's going to meet a, a professor of literary and, and um, uh, he's a, a, a black teacher and, uh, and he's going to take her into uh, a journey of discovering, you know, uh, uh, something that she fainted to ignore, which was racism in the United States. Mm -hmm. And she's a Jewish girl. And something is going to happen in Brooklyn uh, one night. Uh, uh, um, but I don't want to spoil the book. Um, <laughs> but anyway. Well, Chloe, this... Chloe chimed in. She also said she likes Nicolas Mathieu. Yeah, me too. I mean, there is, there is so many writers. So I think you have to go by... Uh, you have to go by gender, you have to go by, you know, what you like, and, uh, uh, yeah, you know what, smell a book. <laughs> no, but really, you know, smell a book, I mean, the, yeah. that's why, you know, the, uh, the, the, the resume are on the back of the book, you have to, don't follow opinions, you know, don't hear someone telling you this is an amazing book that, you, I mean, yeah, of course. But I mean, make your own opinion, Chloe. Uh, what I'm saying is that there is hundreds of writers, my favorite French writer from all times long, the one who makes me smile, cry, that I can read and reread again, it's Romain Gary. Yeah. And uh, I'm in love, I admit it, you know, I'm in love. And, uh, and that doesn't mean that it has to be your favorite writer. But for me, it's, so if you want, I mean, I don't want to uh, avoid your question. I can give you, a, I can give you a list of the recent book that I've read and really loved. Uh, I loved uh, *L'Ami* the Sigrid Nunez. Uh, I loved. Uh, I read recent. I reread recently *Four Three Two One* by Paul Oster, which I really loved. Yeah. Uh, really, really, really loved. I read a book, which. 
literally transcended me, uh, especially in times of this confinement. And it's a, a book written by a, a Turkish writer, uh, Ahmet Altan. And the title of the book in French is Je ne reverrai plus le monde. Uh, I will never see the world again. And it's a story of, a, 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 if he, I mean, it's a true, his true story of a journalist, uh, a writer and, and a teacher who is going to be arrested by the Erdogan uh, police uh, after the coup d'etat because he's accused um, of things that he has not committed just because of his uh, political opinion and, and what he's teaching. And he's going to spend uh, four years in jail and uh, the story tells about the way that he fights for his humanity and, and, and to keep, you know, uh, 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 to stay alive, but also uh, to stay uh, alert and, and, and to keep, you know, uh, um, his mind. And I would say that when you read this book in, in a period of confinement, it helps you a lot to relativize what we are living. So I could go on and on with hundreds of books. <laughs> well, I think it's so interesting that one of the first, the first book you recommended uh, is set in New York, and which kind of made me think about your book that's coming out May 12th, The Woman Like Her, which is set in New York, in a building in New York. Did you ever think about setting it somewhere else, setting it in France, or? A Woman Like Her uh, had to be settled in New York, because okay. uh, a woman like her, uh, the skeleton of the story, I would say, the architecture of the story is based on, uh, it's a life of, uh, a woman like her is the life of the story, uh, it's a story of uh, the life of a building uh, on Park Avenue near Washington Square Park. And this building has a particularity, it has one of the last, uh, a very last um, manual elevator uh, in New York, which has to be operated by a lift man. Um, there is, uh, believe it or not, I think there is uh, only 90 left of those wow. in the city. Did you ride one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's in fact how the story came to me. Oh, nice. And, uh, and, uh, and so the, uh, a, a woman like her, it's the life of, the, uh, of this character, Chloe, who lives on the last floor with a father, with a teacher uh, at New York University. And, uh, and she's an amazing woman, full of life, full of freedom, full of fight, and, uh, and, uh, but she's on a wheelchair. And uh, she's, of course, very dependent of this elevator. And, uh, and it's the story of Senji, who is the operator of the elevator, who uh, knows more about the life of all occupants of this building than their own family mm -hmm. and knows about them. And it's a life of uh, a young entrepreneur from the Indian tech who uh, arrived in town and by a, he's a, a multimillionaire and by a, a concor uh, the, by the uh, a series of uh, crazy events, uh, he's going to end up working to replace the uh, doing the night shift in this elevator. And he's richer than every occupant of the building, but nobody knows about that. And, um, and so it's a comedy. Uh, it's also a comedy de mœurs, as we said in French. Mm -hmm. And it had to be settled in New York because there is not that many cities in the world where you have manual elevator oh, operating. Okay. I mean, and certainly not in Paris. Okay, well, I have to hear about how you ended up in a manual elevator. Yeah, very, I mean, the story came to me uh, three years ago. We were going uh, to a dinner. Uh, in a building in Saint, uh, on Park Avenue. And when we enter in the building, uh, we had, I mean, to join the apartment where the, the dinner uh, happened, we had to ride in one of these elevators. And I was fascinated because I was uh, looking at the uh, elevator operator and I was standing on his back. And, uh, and the idea came to my mind that, you know, and, and, and uh, another couple was in the elevator. Uh, habit and I mean uh, definitely living in the building and I noticed that they were speaking like if the uh, elevator operator was completely invisible they mm -hmm. didn't notice his presence and they were talking about their life mm -hmm. and I was looking at that man and I was and, and suddenly you know when I get out of the elevator I saw this is unbelievable this man knows more about all of them than everybody else it's and, mm -hmm. and he's like not speaking not saying a word 
And so uh, I thought about him for the whole dinner. And, um, and when we left, you know, uh, I, I, I tried to talk with him and say, you know a lot, don't you? And he smiled <laughs> at me and I didn't say anything. So the next day I went back to the building. Okay. And I started to engage a conversation with him. And I say, tell me about your job. It's so fascinating. And so the guy, you know, with pride, you know, looked at me and he say, we're only 92 left in the whole city. Can wow. you believe that? And he said, 7 million people living here and we're only 92. And he said, when I die, my job will die with me. Really? And, uh, and there was a pride. And, and then he said, you know, these sentences uh, which triggers the story. And he said, you know what? I write it 20 times in my life, uh, what, uh, the, the heights of the uh, Mount Everest. Wow. And I say, you're thinking about that? And he said, of course I do. And that's, you know, I think, I mean, I mean, he was the character of a book. And yeah. I said, I have, I have to write a book around this man. And, and about, I mean, this is such a comedy, you know, the life of the occupants. And of course, he was very reluctant. He was not giving me one inch of information about you know, <laughs> Did you tell him what you did for a living? Of course. Okay. Okay. And uh, and he laughed and he said, "I won't say anything." Uh, uh -huh. But then, you know, while we were talking, he was called, you know, to pick up some people, and I was watching them getting out of the building, and I could see right away the relationship they had. So anyway. Yeah, I love it. Did you put in that Everest line because that's a good line? Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> okay, it, no, I mean, it's, but it's I, the book. The story is being treated really as a comedy, you know, about all those tenants in this building, the relationship and what's going on. And of course, a lot of things happen. I see that there is a question which yes. is being asked by... Delphine, do you see it? Uh, it is my you... favorite book in all the ones that I've written. Yes, quel est votre livre favori dans tous ceux que vous avez écrit? What is your favorite book? Or what, what's one that stands out? It's, I mean, it's really hard. Yeah, I always say I your favorite think, book should be your most recent, right? Because <laughs> I hope it's like, uh, honestly, I but no, it's hard because there is a difference between, um, I mean, trying to find your favorite book is like you know, asking yourself if there is one of your child that you like more than another one, yeah, and it's not because, uh, eventually, uh you you have an easier conversation or interaction with one of your children that you love him more than the one you know who is more arguing with you it's a completely different topic the, the thing which i can tell you is uh, the memory that i have of the one that i enjoy the most writing which is different from you know uh, the one that you enjoy the most or you appreciate i had a great great time uh, I really remember enjoying writing the strange journey of, uh, so in France it's called of uh, Mr. Daldry, but in the US publication it's the strange journey of Alice Pendlebury. Mm. I really, really enjoyed writing that book. I extremely enjoyed writing uh, uh, A Woman Like Her, the one that we were talking about. Yeah, I, uh, I had a very painful and hard time and uh, and sadness while I was writing Children of Freedom, but it's maybe one of the books that I'm the most happy to have written. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the, it's a different point of view than, uh, you know, where you stand uh, uh, between, you know, the memory of uh, how happy you were while you wrote and uh, in, and how happy you can be or not from uh, what you have written so far. Mm. Is there a book that, if of all your books, of your 20 books, if you had to pick one to go back to, you know, like you turn in a book and you're like, it's done, but it's mostly done because the publisher tells you that it's done, right? I mean, you could kind of work on these things forever. All of them. Right, all of them. <laughs> all of them, which is why I would, I never try to read the, uh, a page of one of my books. You know, sometimes when you write a new book, you have to go back to one of your old books just because you want to check something about, you know, uh, not repeating yourself. Or 
or and every time I do that and I have to read you know a page that I wrote you know I'm looking at the page and I say oh my god no I didn't publish that why why <laughs> so no no I'm not um, I mean it might look weird but I'm never happy with my own work well luckily millions and millions of people are happy with their own work so but Thank I feel that much. Um, we have another question uh, from Christophe Labar, bonjour Christophe, uh, about the book with the elevator. À la fin, êtes-vous revenu dans l'immeuble et avez-vous offert votre livre à Monsieur Ascenseur? Uh, reconnu dans well, votre well, in fact, uh, the book in English is going to be released uh, on May 20... 12th. 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 <laughs> so, as soon as I get a copy of the book in English, of course I'm going to uh, bring him the book. I mean, I could have bring him the book in French, but I, I think he wouldn't have uh, be really interested about it because yeah. he didn't read it. So I'm definitely, yes, it's in my plan, of course. That's awesome. The question uh, was, yeah, is he going to bring the book to, to the man who works in the elevator? Um, I think that's amazing. I also think you should put it on an Instagram story or something so we can all see it. I think it's really cool. No, when the book was released in France uh, about now uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I definitely, uh, I mean, the story of the elevator and I, on Instagram, I published a lot of picture of the real elevator and the real building where it happened. And, um, but of course I will do that in the US, you know, when the story gets out. Yeah, nice. Um, we have a, another question. What is most challenging about creating characters of the opposite sex or who are very different from you? Which is something you do a lot. Um, in fact, it's, it's more about witnessing than creating. Which is uh, why uh, I, was, I was saying that in a period of confinement, uh, uh, nurturing your creativity becomes harder mm. i mean the the uh the job of a writer comes from uh listening uh watching uh and studying a lot of people around you so uh for example uh you as a writer become the uh, 24 25 years old girl uh, that uh, uh, you were in love with when you were 25 and that, you know, didn't want you at all and, uh, and treated you like, you know, very badly and, and made you feel miserable. And suddenly, because you were so much into this girl, that weirdly, 20 years later, you can become her. Yeah. And yeah. the story is not whether you're wrong or right, you know, it's just about perception. So uh, uh, you, become, uh, uh, you become the best friend you had one day or the best friend that, you know, uh, uh, you wanted to have. You become the character that you dream about. You become, uh, uh, you become the father you had or the father that you dreamt to have. You become... Uh, the uh, that's really the uh, the purpose of uh, imagination and of this. I mean, it's like the uh, the. Will you excuse me one second? Yeah. Tu peux rester, hein? Tu peux rester là, Pupita. <laughs> Sorry, it's my daughter who absolutely wants to stay here, and I say, of course, you can stay. Um. So I'm. What I'm saying is that you you. Uh, this is the perfect Pupita. This is the perfect example. You know. For example, I'll just give you a, a real uh, direct uh, idea of creativity. So my, my four years old daughter uh, uh, was standing on the, uh, on the sofa and her brother came and say, you have to leave that. And she doesn't want, you know, and that makes her suddenly very sad. Hmm. And the way that she said, you know, uh, I want to stay there. Uh, I mean, if you're a writer, uh, uh, but even if you're not a writer, that can trigger you right away the memory of the exact instantaneous sadness of your childhood, yeah. you know, where suddenly something was making you extremely sad. And so if you think about that, and if you focus about that, you can become this child again for the time of the writing. You can write that. 
this is the uh, the way of I see creating character. Yeah, I love that. I think it's a way to relive many experiences and live experiences that you will never actually live. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much for for what you do and. Uh, I'm very excited for that elevator book. I think we all are. So that's on May 12th. Um, now I read something about you that you put your email address in your books and yes. that you respond to everyone. Yes. And when I read that, I had like six emails from people who had read my book in my inbox. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I went and I wrote back to everyone because I was like, if Mark Levy does this, Karen, get it together. Um, so I encourage everyone to spam Mark's inbox. No, to send to send any additional questions to Mark. And I think it's amazing that you do that. I think it's uh, no. I think it's amazing that people not only read your book but spend time. You know, give uh, out of their time to write you. And if they do so, I think the minimum is to write them back. You know, and answer. So uh, yes, I do, of course. Well, that's great. I think it, it speaks. Uh, the kind of person and the kind of writer you are and this has really been such a treat thank and you very much. Um, i want to thank you on behalf of the french american foundation of emmeline and katie and val who are amazing and um we all look forward to coming to your standing book signings one day yeah i really you know what i can't, <laughs> I can't dream of another thing of uh, uh, a future real human reunion with real yeah. person you know shaking hands and hugging and just saying you're there yeah and not behind the glass well i wish you all a very very good day and to stay in good health thank you very much oh thank you so all much right. and i just want to remind people that we have another webinar next week on thursday april 30th at 12 30 and it's with my girl chloe Domrovsky, who just asked you those two questions who is president and ceo of disaster recovery initiative international and an american young leader uh class of 2019 and Renaud Guidet, who is Chief Risk Officer at uh, AXA and a French young leader from 13. And they'll be talking about crisis management during COVID-19. Not books, but you know, somewhat relevant during this time. So merci beaucoup, Marc. My pleasure. Have a great day. And Thank I'm going you. to uh, leave the, the, uh, the Zoom now. You have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.